In this video, we're gonna be talking about evaporators and superheat. Now, evaporators is one of the four major components of, a, of an air conditioning or refrigeration system. There are many more evaporators than we're gonna be talking about in this video because I wanna specifically focus on those that you see in air conditioning with one exception. So evaporators, there are two primary types of evaporators used in air conditioning, natural draft and forced draft. Now natural draft, as you'll see in the next picture, you see a lot of times in big warehouses. Okay, they're not often used in condition space other than big cold storage warehouses and they could almost be considered refrigeration but natural draft evaporators is an evaporator that depends on gravity for air circulation gravitational circulation occurs because cold air is denser than warm air and sinks below the warmer less dense air hot air rises and cold air drops so we see air patterns so when we use a natural draft evaporator, we have tubes with refrigerant in it. Okay, we have pans to catch the condensate, the condensate drain pans, and we rely on the natural airflow of warm air rises, cold air drops to cool the space. Okay, again, this is used a lot in what we consider cold storage warehouses and it's older systems. You do not see it much in comfort cooling, um, actually very rarely in comfort cooling. Forced draft evaporators is what we really want to concentrate on. A forced draft evaporator is an evaporator that is equipped with some sort of fan to blow the air over the evaporator coils. Okay, it's a compact arrangement of refrigerant cooled tubes and fins. These coils are usually enclosed in a metal housing. So this is a forced draft evaporator. This is what you're used to seeing in most air conditioning systems. In split systems, this will be on the air handler or furnace. In window units, you'll have it on the inside portion of the window unit. Fan blows, the mo blows air through the evaporator coil. The majority of air-cooled evaporator constructions are what we consider fin and tube, plate and microchannel. The most widely used and recognized is the fin and tube evaporator. Fin and tube evaporators have metal fins of various styles and types, and they connect the, they're connected to the evaporator tubing. So this is an example of the fins before the tubing is run through it, okay? All of these holes here are for refrigerant tubing to run through and it's just fin after fin after fin. Some of the common combinations of material used on these evaporators could be copper tubing with aluminum fins, copper tubing with copper fins, and steel tubing with aluminum fins. Okay, now more and more you'll also see aluminum tubing with aluminum fins because aluminum has much better rates of heat transfer than copper. The fin spacing varies between half inch and one and a half inch for natural draft evaporators and one sixteenth inch to one quarter inch for forced draft evaporators. The spacing of the fins impacts the amount of surface area exposed to the air that is being cooled. So manufacturers can adjust the cooling ability of an evaporator by changing the spacing and the number of fins. The more fins, the more surface area that's exposed to the air stream. Fin spacing is also adjusted to compensate for the depth of the coil. The deeper the coil, the greater fin spacing. This is done to maximize air restriction. Evaporators that have six to, is six to eight inch depth usually have one inch spacing. Those with 18 to 20 inch depth often have one and a half inch spacing. A fin spacing of an inch or less decreases air turbulence. The tubing in an evaporator is usually 5 8 inch OD. 3 quarter inch OD is used on large evaporators. So again, just if you take a look at the different types of spacing, you can see the bottom evaporator has much wider spacing than the top evaporator. 
The closer together fins has more surface area because there's more fins. The wider apart fins has less surface area. The closer together fins does restrict airflow. The wider apart allows more airflow to move through faster. There's two operating designs that we worry about with evaporators and they're used in different locations. Direct expansion, the refrigerant directly cools the air. The evaporator coil is full of refrigerant and air is blowing across that coil. That's direct expansion, sometimes seen as DX systems. The indirect expansion system, the refrigerant cools a secondary medium such as water or glycol. This water or glycol secondary medium flows through the coil and the air stream. Okay, so the coil in the indirect expansion is full of chilled water or glycol. The direct expansion, the coil has refrigerant. Indirect expansion systems are much more seen in high rises and big office buildings. Okay, they have a chiller someplace either on the roof or the basement with a compressor. They might have a cooling tower elsewhere. Okay, they're used in large, large buildings and they use chilled water rather than um, refrigerant in each of the spaces. You see these a lot of times also in hotel units if it's not like if it's not mounted in the outside wall if the unit is in a closet someplace near a hotel room in a hotel room you have your individual thermostat control but most likely it's going to be a chilled water system. There's two types of direct expansion coils that exist. You have a dry type and you have a flooded type. The dry type uses 25% less refrigerant than the flooded type. It has more vapor in the evaporator and it has less chance of a flood back to the compressor. The dry type is the primary type of coil we see. The disadvantages of the dry type coil is that there's a slower pull down with heavy loads. The system runs with higher head pressures. Okay, Dry type coils, it takes a while to cool off the space. Runs with high head pressures. Okay, There are two purposes of evaporators. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. Evaporators both cool and dehumidify. Cooling changes the sensible heat content of the air. You can actually measure this. I can measure the different temperatures. Dehumidification changes the latent heat content and the moisture in the air. This is the process described in the psychometric chart. We must keep indoor humidity under 50%. Now, the other thing you have to realize is that when, you're, when the humidity in the airspace is lower, people have a tendency to feel cooler. So our primary purpose of air conditioning to start with is we dehumidify. That's why there's a lot of condensate that comes off air conditioning systems. We have to pull that moisture out of the air, turn it to water, and drain it away. Evaporator design is most often done by mechanical engineers. You'll have a catalog to choose evaporator and a condenser combination based on the cooling requirements and size. Do not install anything that is not matched by a catalog coming from the manufacturer. Okay, If you try to mix and match units, you will not get the efficiency that they're designed for. There are several factors looked at for evaporator design, primarily pressure drop and evaporator capacity. Causes of pressure drop are long evaporators, not the actual size of the evaporator, but the length of the run of the tubing. Now they solve this by putting multiple evaporator circuits with a distributor. The other cause of a pressure drop is the tubing is too small. Okay, so again, when we're looking at an evaporator coil on a natural gas furnace, okay, we have our return air coming in, we have our blower motor here coming up through the heat exchanger, and then we have that, this is an A coil, it's shaped like an A, sitting on top of it in the supply ductwork. We have our liquid line and our suction line. This is a fin-tubed air coil. 
Now, if the evaporator is not sized properly, you're going to have a low gas velocity. In other words, the gas is going through that evaporator and returning to the compressor is going to be too low of a velocity. They're not fast enough. This is going to cause poor oil return and it doesn't allow a scrubbing effect. It, refrigerant debris builds up in the evaporator tubes and it will cause eventually an oil clogged evaporator. Low gas velocity usually caused by incorrectly sized evaporators or incorrectly sized line sets. Factors that affect evaporator capacity is the surface area, the temperature difference, otherwise known as delta T, the refrigerant velocity, the conductivity, okay, how fast the heat moves through the metal that it's made of, the metal thickness, and the air volume. Air volume is pretty important in air conditioning. We're going to talk about it more in the future, but we have to have 400 cubic feet per minute of air. That's what systems are designed for per ton. So if I have a five ton unit, five times 400 is 2000. More and more we are seeing what we call micro channel evaporators. Now micro channel evaporators are very close to the fin and tube design however they have an inlet and an outlet okay and then these are basically manifolds or headers they're more compact and efficient than fin and tube evaporators microchannel describes a construction in which the fluid passes through passages are less than one millimeter in diameter the passages in a microchannel evaporator are surrounded by tightly packed fins at further increase the surface area for heat transfer. Okay, what happens here, okay, is that the fluid, we have our headers on the sides, and these are little passages that pass the fluid and the gases through from the inlet to the outlet of the evaporator. Sort of like a manifold. These evaporators are made of extruded aluminum to create small passages through a flat tube. Refrigerant flows through the header and into small holes in the tube. By using flat surfaces, the microchannel evaporator has more tube surface, contacting the fins, which increases conduction. There's also greater number of fins per square inch, which improves convection. Microchannel evaporators are 30% more efficient than traditional fin and tube evaporators. With this design, their size can be relatively small for the same cooling capacity of a traditional evaporator. Just another view of the microchannel design. So what you have here is you have your header, okay, and then the refrigerant liquid passes through this way and boils off just like it does in a normal evaporator. But you see the little channels that are in here. Okay, passes through. Look at the little holes, less than one millimeter, and it passes through here. It has a lot of surface area that either connects with the fins or is available for airflow. Okay, so we have a manifold on this side, and manifold on that side. It connects suction line, liquid line, or liquid line suction, depending on the direction of the system. Now, we can't talk about evaporators without talking about superheat, because evaporators and superheat sort of go together. Superheat is a sensible heat that is added to the vapor refrigerant after the change of state has taken place. By change of state, we mean that the refrigerant has boiled off from a liquid to a vapor. The difference between the boiling refrigerant and the suction line temperature is superheat. Superheat is used to check if the evaporator is a proper level of refrigerant. Superheat is gained in the evaporator. Refrigerant picks up additional sensible heat after the change in state takes place. Okay, let's take a look at an evaporator here. We have our liquid line coming in, okay, to our TXV. We have a TXV bulb here, okay, it's connected. Our temperatures coming in is 40 degrees. 
okay? Because that's our pressure temperature relationship. Our boiling point is 40 degrees. So we come in, we have a 40 degree evaporator until all of this liquid is boiled off. From that point to the end of the evaporator, we will continue to absorb sensible heat. This whole boiling process down here is latent heat. We cannot measure that. But from the point that all the liquid is boiled off, we will continue to absorb sensible heat. So if I have a 40 degree boiling point and a 55 degree suction line at the, at the sensing bulb or even further down, my evaporator superheat in this case is 15 degrees. Normal superheat is between 8 and 12 degrees for a TXV system. Depending on the application, especially with specific specialized equipment, it can be lower or higher, but 8 to 12 degrees for a TXV system. If the superheat is too high, it means what we have called as a starved coil. This coil is not getting enough refrigerant. Could be a low charge, okay, but you have to look further into it. Just because the superheat is high, does not mean it's undercharged. If it's, if it's a TXV system, have to check the TXV for, for proper operation as well. If the superheat is too low, you could have a flooded coil. That means too much refrigerant. Do not adjust refrigerant with just superheat unless you're sure you know that you know how the system should work. Okay. For example, a TXV system is designed to maintain a constant superheat. So you have to make sure your metering device is working properly, okay, before you add or subtract a refrigerant. So always check all the components before you adjust a refrigerant charge. See, the thing is, refrigerant is never used up. That refrigerant, once it's charged properly, should stay in that system forever unless there's two things, basically one thing, a leak. Okay, so just adding refrigerant is not the answer to most of the problems. Complete vaporization of the refrigerant should occur around the last bend of the evaporator. Any additional heat absorbed, that sensible heat, is now referred to as superheat. The TXV as a metering device is maintained, designed to maintain proper superheat. So to measure the superheat, Take the temperature of the suction line with the thermometer. I use a clamp-on probe. It's the best way to do it. Best to do within six inches of the evaporator. Take suction line pressure and convert it to temperature of the saturation. In other words, you take your pressure, use your temperature pressure chart, or if you have electronic gauges, they might do it for you. And you want to get the temperature of saturation. That's the boiling point temperature in your evaporator. Low side gauge to temperature. Subtract the saturation temperature from the suction line temperature. So as an example, if I have an R22 system, if my suction pressure is 68.5 PSI, that means my boiling point is 40 degrees. If I have a suction line temperature of 50 degrees, I take the 50 minus 40 and I have a superheat of 10 degrees. Add 2 PSI to your suction line if the condenser is in a remote location and the suction line is well over 8 feet, or if you're working on a split system. Now, honestly, 2 PSI doesn't do much, okay? So, but th the correct way to do this is add 2 PSI to your suction line pressure. Domestic and commercial units, 8 to 12 degrees superheat is a rule of thumb. Whatever must be done to the superheat, the opposite must be done to the refrigerant. So if you have to lower superheat, you add refrigerant after you checked all other possibilities. Okay, again, TXVs, don't just go adding refrigerant. If you have a superheat of 20 degrees, superheat must be lowered. Increase refrigerant charge or flow. And my parentheses in here, or flow, is because of TXVs. You might have to adjust it. 
If you have a superheat of 2 degrees, the superheat must be raised, decrease the refrigerant charge or flow. Remember, TXVs and AVs are adjustable. Anytime you make a superheat adjustment, you must wait 10 to 15 minutes prior to making the next adjustment. This wait is so the system will stabilize. Do not hurry through superheat adjustments. You have to give the system time to stabilize. With a fixed orifice or metering device or a cap tube, adding charge lowers superheat. Removing charge raises superheat. Again, the opposite must be done to refrigerant from what you're doing, want the superheat to do. The difference between the temperature of the refrigerant boiling in the evaporator and the temperature at the evaporator is known as evaporator superheat. There's two different types of superheat. That's why we put these notes in here. The difference between the temperature of the refrigerant boiling in the evaporator and the temperature at the evaporator outlet is known as evaporator superheat. When measuring evaporator superheat on a commercial system with a long suction line, the pressure reading should be taken at the evaporator outlet, not at the compressor inlet. Because there could be a pressure drop. Superheat measurements are best taken with the system operating at design conditions. Evaporators can be multi-pass. This means the coil has been folded over on itself and is actually two or three coils clamped together and fed by a distributor. Remember, a distributor is that octopus looking device that comes in right after a metering device. When an evaporator coil is multi-pass and has a superheat that is higher th than others, this can be caused by uneven air distribution, a block distributor, or even a dirty coil section. Okay, so occasionally you'll have an evaporator where one section is showing ice and freezing up. Can have a block distributor, or even that coil section might be dirty, because dirt on a coil will affect superheat. Evaporators that are used to chill liquids, like the ones found in slurping machines and soda dispensers, can have normal superheat measurements but not be cooling properly. Okay, you can have deposits built up on the liquid side of the evaporator or poor circulation of the liquid. This can also happen in chiller barrels in water, in chilled water systems. So that's why we left this in here is because this can happen in chiller barrels. Now I made notes a few slides ago. One of my additional notes was that evaporator superheats, okay, is the temperature of the refrigerant boiling in the evaporator and the temperature at the evaporator outlet. There's an additional superheat measurement that you'll come across occasionally called a system superheat. A system superheat is the difference in temperature between the refrigerant boiling in the evaporator and the temperature of the suction line at the condenser right before it goes into the compressor. Okay, system superheat takes the entire length of the suction line into account. That is actually what you're most often going to use when you're doing inspections and checks on split systems and package units.